Well, good morning. Bright and sunny morning here in Florence, Arizona. I love it. The weather is awesome, man. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study through the Psalms. And we're going to be in Psalm 18. So if you have your Bibles, your computers, your iPads, your smartphones, <laughs> whatever it is you might use, we're going to be in Psalm 18. And Psalm 18 is pretty long, so I've split it in two. I'm going to do the first half, uh, verses 1 to 24 today, and then next Sunday I'm going to do the second half, verse 25 to the end of the chapter. We're going to look at David's deliverance from his enemies and how David praises the Lord for it. It's a pretty awesome song. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you and we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us, God, and Lord, I just pray with everything that's going on in our lives, everything that's going on in our country and around the world, Father, I just pray this is a time that you draw hearts and minds and spirits unto you, Lord God. Father, that we would recognize and realize that at any moment, our life could be demanded, our life could be taken, God, and we need to be ready to meet you, Lord. We all have our own enemies. We all have people that don't like us or care for us or maybe don't want anything to do with us. So it's pretty incredible to look at this psalm that David had this morning. And uh, I just pray for your anointing on it. Bless it, God. Speak to us mightily, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 18, in the beginning, before the psalm, it says, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And David said, here we go, verse one. I will love you, O Lord, with all my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, notice this, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils, and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet, and he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven. And the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out of, into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. <clears throat> For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. 
I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Now, it's interesting because Psalm 18 is actually a Thanksgiving psalm. I mean, we know hindsight is always 2020. When you look back, you can see and kind of interpret and understand what had taken place. But here David is looking back over his life. He's remembering the times that God has intervened to help him. And you know what he's doing? He's, he's praising God for it. He's thanking God for it. Psalm 18 is also a kingship psalm, a kingship psalm. It's about God's uncountable blessings on the king and his kingdom. Some of the kingship songs look beyond the earthly king to God's promise of the Messiah. And in a sense, this is what we're seeing here. In fact, as we're going to see next Sunday, Paul quotes verse 49 to show that Jesus came for the Gentiles as well as for the Jews in Romans 15, verses 8 and 9. Listen to what it says. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God. The circumcision is talking about the Jewish people. To confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. For this reason, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. I love the way this commentator said it. He said, even though every Davidic king might make this psalm his own, it belonged especially to David, whose testimony it was, and to Christ, who was David's offspring. I love that. Psalm 18 leads us to 2 Samuel. I remember many, many times going through 1 and 2 Samuel, and we were studying the life of David. And it's just incredible, man, First and Second Samuel. This is a historical setting. It's almost the same in Second Samuel chapter 22. In fact, even the title is from the chapter in verses 1 and 2. Now, when we look in Second Samuel, the psalm appears as David's last words to its summary thanksgiving for God's deliverances throughout his life of service throughout his life of service. First, there was a deliverance from King Saul. I mean, all those years, David had to hide from Saul in the wilderness. Just think about it. Here Samuel the prophet comes, anoints David, the next king of Israel, and David has to run for his life from the first king, Saul, for 10 to 12 years. I mean, it's amazing. You read the scriptures and you would think that it was within a year or so that David became king after Saul died. It was 10 to 12 years he had to run. You see, God has promises that he's made for us. And sometimes those promises don't happen right away. Many take time. Some could take years. You're praying about things, you're waiting on them, and you're thinking, why hasn't God answered me? Why am I still praying about this thing and God hasn't done anything yet? Keep praying. Keep trusting God. You know, the, the Old Testament says God is not a man that he can lie. He's God. In God is truth. God's entire word is truth. In the second half of 1 Samuel... It begins with Saul's jealousy of David over Israel, giving the praise and glory to David more than to King Saul. I mean, that really, that ticked Saul off. Here they're coming back from the battle and these women with their tambourines are singing and they're talking about Saul, what was it? Saul killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. I think that's what it says there in uh, 1 Samuel. Man, Saul went off the ridge. <laughs> he went off the hook on this, man. From that moment on, 
He says, this dude's going to take my kingdom from me. And he, it was on. It was on. He was going to try to get rid of David. David was going about his business. And here Saul is continually trying to kill him. I mean, we, you can read that many different occasions. Even when David split to the land of the Philistines. Later, he went to the cave of Adullam and other areas in the wilderness. Saul would hear where David is. Someone would say, man, we found the dude. We know where he's at. And Saul would immediately go after him because he wanted to kill him. Now, when we read the story, we see a lot of amazing accounts of how God had brought Saul to a place where David could have killed him. David could have wiped the dude out many times, man. Remember in the cave when Saul went to relieve himself? <laughs> Here's David with his 400 men. And his men are saying, look, God has delivered the guy into your hands, David. Get rid of the dude. David almost listened to him. Remember what he do? He went up to him. He snuck up behind him. He took his knife and he cut off a piece of Saul's robe while he was relieving himself. Now, I don't know how that took place. I don't want to get the rerun when we get to heaven. But <laughs> David could have killed him. He could have killed him, and he didn't do it. Why? Because of David's loyalty to Saul as the Lord's anointed. He recognized that Saul was the Lord's anointed. David spared Saul. And you know what? It comes down to this. Sowing and reaping. God spared David. God spared David. But God does deal with those who want vengeance in their own way. Oh, God, he'll deal with it. He takes care of it. When we get to the end of 1 Samuel, Saul dies when a battle turns bad with the Philistines. I mean, it cost him his life. And then at the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 1, David becomes king. First, he becomes king over the tribe of Judah, his tribe. And then I believe it was about seven years later, there in Hebron, David became king over all of Israel, all 12 tribes. God went on to deliver David during his years of fighting Israel's enemies. God gave David a lot of victories, man. You get a chance, read 1st, 2nd Samuel. I mean, it's just a pretty awesome story of David's life. When you think you're dealing with drama and trials, look what David went through. This was when David established a kingdom. In 2nd Samuel chapter 18, we have all the victories David had over the Philistines, the Moabites, the Arameans of Damascus, and the Edomites, God then delivered David from the hand of his son, Absalom. I mean, Absalom plotted to get rid of his father. He wanted to take the kingdom for himself. David ended up having to flee from Jerusalem, and he had to take refuge in the wilderness again. Can you imagine what was going through David's mind? Man, I've been here. I did this movie. <laughs> Why am I here again? Well, you know the story. In the battle, Absalom's armies were defeated. Absalom was killed. Here God had delivered David again. Even though David said he would have rather been killed instead of his son. That's how much he loved Absalom, his son. Who doesn't love their son and their daughter? Psalm 18 comes in at 2 Samuel chapter 22. After the events of David's life, he's expressing thanksgiving to God for God's protection and for God's deliverance during all those years that were so dangerous, man, in his life. As he's looking back, I love the way David is professing his love for God. Here God had shown himself to be David's deliverer and to be worthy of David's praise. You know, we're given two things here to portray God. 
One relates to David's military victories, picturing God as his strength, his shield, and his horn of salvation. The other relates to the times David was forced to run from his enemies. God is David's rock. He's his fortress. He's his deliverer. He's his strength. He's his stronghold. Man, does that sound familiar today? God is our rock. He is our fortress. He's the one who delivers us. He's our strength. He's the only way we can go forward. When we get slammed with the drama and the trials of this life, I turn to my Father in heaven. God strengthen me, man. I can't do this on my own. God is my stronghold. But most importantly, actually the theme of Psalm 18, the Lord was David's rock and the Lord is our rock. He's our foundation. The professor of classics at Auckland University, E.M. Blakelock is his name. He wrote a series of articles for eternity entitled New Light on Bible Imagery. Bible imagery. And the article went on to say, listen to this. One of the images he wrote about was rock. He showed that it has several uses. First, it's an image for protection and shade. In the hot, sandy lands of the Bible, the struggle of life against the merciless elements is intense in a way we can hardly appreciate in our more temperate climate. When the spring rains come, a light carpet of green, doomed to be scorched by the sun, and then covered with sand just a few short weeks, will emerge on the desert's edge. You know, I've been to Israel twice, and I, I know exactly what he's talking about. But set a rock in the sand, and soon a small oasis develops on the boulder's leeward side. The desert's feeble Life prospers under the rock's protection. Similarly, a man traveling through the desert during the hottest hours of the day can find shade in the rock's shadow and can survive and continue his journey. We see Isaiah describing this in Isaiah 32, verse 2. Listen to what Isaiah the prophet said. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Here David is saying he was sheltered by God. He says he thrived because the Lord was his rock. Are you guys catching the parallel here? <laughs> Jesus is our rock. The rock actually portrays God as a refuge for his people. This idea, this is the idea in Psalm 18. I mean, David is thinking of God's protection during the years he was forced to hide from Saul. And then later, when his own son Absalom came against him. Now, I'm sure David knew every hiding place in the wilderness. I mean, the guy had 10 to 12 years of running from Saul. So when he fled to the rocks, David knew he'd be protected and safe. He knew it. Standing on the rock. When David was standing on the rock, he could look down and watch his enemies as they were pursuing him. I mean, it suggests having a solid foundation under your feet. A rock is actually contrasted to what? To mud and sand. Psalm 40, verse two, he also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. You know, this is what the Holy Spirit will do with us believers. He's gonna set our feet upon a rock. He's going to establish our steps. Jesus used the same image in the Sermon on the Mount. He contrasted those who build their lives on sand, remember the story, with those who build on a rock. Those who build on sand end up suffering the loss of everything when the rains come. 
I mean, Jesus said their house will be taken away. But the house that is built on rock, it stands strong against the rains, whether it be a flood, wind, storm, whatever it is. It stands strong because its foundation is on the rock. Psalm 18 speaks to God's faithfulness in each of these ways. God is a shelter. God is a stronghold. He is a solid foundation for anyone who will build on him. It's interesting that in Psalm 17, what we studied last week, David speaks of his enemies tracking him down and surrounding him so he wouldn't be able to escape. I mean, they wanted to overthrow him. They wanted to devour him, man. They wanted to eat him up and spit him out like a lion hungry for the prey. Here in Psalm 18, he says in verses four, four and five, look at verse four. The pangs of death surrounded me and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol, hell, surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. Notice it's the same thing. Each psalm has David responding in the same way in his distress. Probably the greatest thing about this part of the psalm is the incredible way David describes God rising from his throne in heaven in response to his servant's cry, to David's cry, parting the clouds, descending to fight the king's battles with earthquakes, thunder, storms, and lightning. <laughs> it's amazing, man. It's amazing. You know, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out how many times God came down and fought our battles for us. He took care of it. He took care of it. Now, as far as we know, David never experienced a literal display of God's presence in these ways, as far as we know. I mean, the scripture doesn't show us or tell us that. But it doesn't mean he just made these things up. David wasn't sitting there praying and just making this up. When you study the various passages of the Bible, and this is what's so important, and it's key to reading through God's word, man, and knowing the, the whole word. All 66 books of the Bible written by over 40 authors. Total span of 1,500 years. Can you believe it? That's the span of the Bible. What David is saying came from the accounts of God manifesting himself. Verses seven to 11 is associated with God descending on Mount Sinai to give the law to Moses. That was accompanied by what? The earth shaking, dark clouds, lightning. Hebrews 12 verses 18 to 21 describes Sinai as a mountain burning with fire, darkness, gloom, and storm. So terrifying that even Moses said, I am trembling with fear. In verses 12 to 14, they refer to God's intervention in the battles against the Canaanites at the time of the Jewish conquest. When Joshua was leading them into the promised land, they had crossed over the, Jor the Jordan River and they took Jericho, the walls came down and they took Jericho and that began their conquest into the land to separate it out and conquer it for the 12 tribes of Israel. Particularly against the Southern Confederation, the battle described in Joshua chapter 10. That's when God sent hailstones against the Jews' enemies. The channels of the sea described in verses 14 to 15, David no doubt is thinking about the parting of the Red Sea at the exodus from Egypt when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt and the parting of the Jordan River when Israel crossed over into Canaan through Jericho. I like the way Spurgeon describes these verses. Charles Spurgeon, listen to what he says. 
David has in mind's eye the glorious manifestation of God in Egypt. At Sinai and on different occasions to Joshua and the judges, and he considers that his own case exhibits the same glory of power and goodness and that therefore he may accommodate the descriptions of former displays of the divine majesty into his own hymn of praise. So what David's doing? David has accomplished the same thing by reference to the special manifestations of God's presence and power in past victories. Now, we read the scriptures. We know that God did deliver him, which is what verses 16 to 19 describe. Actually, it's the specific answer to David's cry in Psalm 17 that we studied last time. Here's the point. God delivered David because of the upright manner in which David lived his life. This is the basis for his appeal for God's help that he had made. Remember in Psalm 17, verse 3, David says this. He's speaking to God. He says, you have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and have found nothing. I have purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. Here David says in verses 20, 21, look at verse 20. He said, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Now, right away you're thinking, uh, really, David? <laughs> Your righteousness? Look what he says. According to the cleanness of my hand, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Now, I had to think about that a minute. You see... Because this psalm is supposed to have been written late in David's life as a recollection of God's repeated deliveries of him, the question that comes up, and this is what I was thinking of, and you're probably thinking of it now, how could David say this in light of his sin with Bathsheba and against her husband, Uriah the Hittite, by killing him. How could David say this? How could he claim to have been blameless and that he kept himself from sin? Well, let me say this. It's a good question. If you find the answer, let me know. <laughs> let me know. The answer is seen in the verses we'll look at next time. David takes what he says about himself in verses 20 to 24 to express the principle that God honors righteousness and judges sin even in this life. But again, it's not a promise that the righteous will always prosper because some can and do suffer. They can have experiences like Job and others in the scriptures. Now, it doesn't mean one can do right all the time. We're sinners. We're sinners. But as a general principle, when we live for God and we are trying to do it God's way, we're trying to do it God's way, I mean, he cares for us and he blesses us. You see, God looks at the heart. He looks at the heart. He's not looking at the mind. He's not looking at all this other junk we're doing. He's looking at the heart. David was a sinner. David did fall into sin. But David had a heart after God's own. He loved the Lord, man. You see, just because you love the Lord doesn't mean you walk on water. You will sin. It doesn't give you a license to sin like Paul was saying to the church in Corinth. You don't have a license to sin, but you are a sinner. Why do you think God sent Christ to die in our place and to make that ultimate atonement through the sacrifice of his only begotten son to shed his blood for us on that cross? You see, 
When God looks at you and me now as believers, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But because he does, it doesn't mean I can go out there and be stupid and go sideways on God and walk away and do whatever I want to do. I got to keep my heart right with God. Do I make mistakes? I make mistakes. Do I blow it at times? I blow it at times. But God knows I love him, man. And he knows I am trying my best. That's all he asks of us. We don't have our glorified body yet. We're still in this stinking, wretched flesh. <laughs> and it's getting older. I'm getting older. Man, I'm just getting closer to going home. Amen. I'm ready. I am so, oh, let's blow this pop stand, man. I'm ready to go. You see, when we go our own way, we bring misery and destruction on our lives. This, this is all David is saying. This is all David is saying. David's sin with Bathsheba is an ex illustration and a proof of this principle. David suffered in many different ways as a consequence of that sin. But even though that took place and happened, just as similar transgressions are committed by every one of us. On the whole, David was nevertheless a man after God's own heart and he was greatly blessed by God. He was greatly blessed by God. He tried his best to serve God. That, that's all God wants. That's all he wants us to do. And because he did and God knew that was his heart to do, I love it. God was faithful to him throughout his long and prosperous rule over the nation of Israel. God was faithful to him. One of the great sermons of evangelist D.L. Moody was on God being our rock. And you know what? Though it wasn't based on Psalm 18, it was based on Deuteronomy 32 verse 31, which read, for the rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. What caught Moody's imagination was the second part of that verse. Even our enemies themselves being judges. Moody argued in times of trouble, the objects trusted by unbelievers fail them. Fail them. And they concede that they don't find the help in their gods that Christians find in our God. Moody claimed that in the hour of their death, they don't turn to their atheism or pantheism. If they turn to anything at all, guess who they turn to? They ask a minister to pray for them. <laughs> I've been there many times in the hospitals, in the house where the person has moments left before they're going to pass. Moody said, I have never heard of an infidel going down to his grave happily. They have nothing to hang on to. Their rock is not as our rock, and they confess it. I mean, it's not a shock to say as Christians, we don't live perfect lives. Do you live a perfect life? Come on, let's be real. Let's be legit. Let's be straight up here this morning. Do you live a perfect life? No, none of us do. None of us do. Not even a pastor. We do stumble over and over again, sometimes terribly. But when we come to the end of our life, you ready? And we look back. As David is doing here in Psalm 18, we will confess that whatever our failings may have been, our God has never, ever, ever failed us. God has never failed us. We confess as a true saying, 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. 
He cannot deny himself. Guys, Jesus is our rock. There is no rock like him. We praise him because he is the rock of our salvation. Next time, next Sunday, if we're here, if Jesus hasn't taken us home yet, <laughs> we'll finish Psalm 18. So you can read from verse 25 to the end, and we will cover that next Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you. We do thank you, Lord, that uh, we're going to heaven because of you, not because of our actions, not because of any righteousness that we think we have. We're told in the scriptures that our righteousness is as filthy rags. We thank you that we have been declared righteous through the precious shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for all those that are following us through the Psalms here on Sunday mornings as we study them, as we expound on them, as we take personal application to our lives and we examine our walk before you, God, Lord, I pray, draw us ever, ever nearer to you, Lord. Your word tells us that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. God, we love you. We ask your blessing on the rest of this day. Bless this week as we lift it up to you. And Father, I pray for those who are going to be watching this study as we continue in the Gospel of Matthew on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock. Father, I pray that you would even speak to their hearts, Lord. God, strengthen us. That's why I love teaching the word. Because when we teach the word and we understand what it says, we get strength from it. It builds up our faith. It makes us so we can walk stronger in you, God, and not the things of this life tear us down and, and break us in pieces, Lord. God, our, our future is in your hands. We're looking to you, God, the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, we know we're going to see you one day soon. How awesome is that going to be? And then to see all of our loved ones, God. All of our loved ones again. What a familial reunion that's going to be. A family reunion. Lord, we look to that day. Until then, help us to stay focused on you, Lord. We love you and we praise you. And again, we thank you for your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said... Amen. I'll see you there or I'll see you in the air. Love you guys.